Greetings, I am the Hearth Guy, and I am back with the next video talking about potential death battle matchups for the Fire Emblem villains. If you're new here, I've already made an entire series of videos covering the Fire Emblem protagonists, and one for the Kaga era of Fire Emblem villains. Just for the sake of recap, I will not be reusing characters, I will try to avoid reusing franchises unless no other clear choices are available, and more as a personal standard, I will attempt to not use too many characters who appeared on death battle proper. Which is actually not too hard on this video, although I will say what has become harder is determining which characters to actually put up here. As the games go on, more antagonists get more and more attention and could be argued as important enough to be considered major villains. You'll see the result of that problem as we move forward. But to do so, let the matchups begin. We'll start this off with Nurgle from Fire Emblem Blazing Sword against Solus from Dragon Age. Okay, seriously, Dragon Age is starting to become the Tales of Vesperia for this series of matchups. Extremist mages who began as good men hoping to foster peace, but over time came to believe that the only right path was to cause genocide on humanity so a superior people can regain the world that once belonged to them. While one only sinks further into hate and madness, the other comes to see humanity as genuinely valuable, but even so intends to break down the very bonds of reality to see his own people return to their rightful place. I had considered Hojo from Final Fantasy VII, but we only ever get one example of him in combat, and figuring out anything from that is just tough. Just conceptually, Solus would be expected to win as he, in his prime, was a reality-bending super mage that was considered a god to the elves, but in his current form, he's more manageable for a villain like Nurgle. Solus' power is great as he grows stronger, but depending on which point in the story they use, it could affect what abilities he has. A Solus from the main game he appears in can have extremely varied gear due to the nature of items in Inquisition and has access to pretty much the entire gambit of spells and sub-varieties. Whether it's dispelling magic, which is very useful against another spellcaster, creating wide AoE spells, inflicting status effects, he's got it all, but he's also got unique abilities tied to his subclass, the Rift Mage, creating and controlling telekinetic fists, regaining mana based off the damage he does to his enemy, debuffing his opponent's attacks, and creating a rain of up to 55 individual meteors. Yes, there's an exact number for this. Now, if we do take into account his godly powers, then we've seen that he can at least petrify a person with a thought, and manipulate the veil which he created to absurd degrees, even to the point of breaking it by the most recent Dragon Age game. By comparison, Nurgle's greatest feats revolve around his knowledge over life and death, his ability to sap a person's life force and create morphs, what are basically puppets with personalities formed from the souls of the dead. Nurgle is technically able to use up to S rank in all forms of magic and even the dreaded staves, though we never actually see him use them. His only weapon being the Arishkigal tome that, based off its shown effect, opens a black hole-like portal to some distant underworld to drag the target into, or maybe drag their life force into. If we were to consider his possible weapons that include things like Nosferatu for healing via attacking, Luna, which negates resistances, the ever-dreaded Silence and Sleep Staves, and the much rarer Berserk Staff. Beyond these, most of his options are just raw power in varying degrees and are largely comparable to whatever Solus has, with the exception that his magic doesn't run out based off a tome or staff. But it's the characterization that'd be very interesting to see, as both are fighting for different groups to reclaim their positions of authority. Solus wants to uplift the elves, and Nurgle wants to make way for the dragons. In Nurgle, Solus can see the deep end of his own desires and how he is different. That even though his actions will lead to widespread death, he at least has the decency to care about the lives lost, while Nurgle only sees them as fuel. One image that could be cool is to see if Nurgle used Arishkigal to suck Solus into it, only for Solus to break back out by shattering through the veil. There's a lot of creative ma there's a lot of creative magic stuff that you could put into this one, particularly compared to some of the villains from the last video. Prince Zephiel, instigating antagonist of Binding Blade versus Duke, the final boss and antagonist of Tales of Vesperia. Former heroes that once fought to protect humanity but grew disillusioned by their wickedness, immaturity, and pettiness. Eventually, they came to desire a world put back into the hands of older, more magically powerful beings. The dragons for Zephia, and the Entelechea for Duke. Duke wields the sword Dane Nomos, which allows him to manipulate air, which is the power source of magic in his world. And through that and the mastery of the blade, he can do some pretty absurd tricks such as limited levitation, telekinesis, teleportation, and a wide variety of special elemental arts. His biggest hitting attacks are Big Bang, which is a screen-covering explosion of light magic, and Brave Vesperia, which he only accesses in his final form, the Radiant Winged One. 
Brave Vesperia is an amalgamation of the ultimate arts of all the protagonists of Tales of Vesperia in one attack, with all their effects on top. Duke was able to use his own power to equal that of Yuri and his team in the final moments of the game to destroy an enormous world-ending thing called the Autophagos. And I'm sure you power scalers out there can figure out the math here, but just assuming he did his fair share of 50% would be huge. As for Zephyl, he has a clear chance for parallels between him and Hector, who he defeated in battle during the Binding Blade, and because we're in the era of the Elib games, we're talking about the unique weapons of those games, just like with Ellie Wood, Hector, and Roy in the first series. Zephyl wields one such weapon which was partially responsible for causing the Scouring and the Endless Winter, which caused a nuclear winter-like event across Elib. This sword, which I only assume is pronounced Exax, can only be wielded by Zephyl and seems to channel some amount of lightning through it. While it's debatable whether the sword can still wield the level of power it did, I felt it worth mentioning. Truth be told, Zephyl's kit is just far more limited than Duke's, but it's more the themes that interest me than anything else. What I'd love to see is a post-game Duke fighting Zephyl, a Duke who has already learned the lesson that he can believe in humanity at least a little bit, and stand as what Zephyl both used to be and what he could have become. All the while, even though he thinks otherwise, Zephyl has become the very sort of human that Duke hated, which can in turn lead to self-reflection for Duke as a character. If you really want to add spice, you can have Zephyl see the ambivalence once within Duke and try to goad him into unleashing it while going on about humanity's evils. Through the fight, Duke can see himself in Zephyl and grow thankful that he's turned away from the path that he did, before ensuring Zephyl can no longer continue the path he's on, now able to save the world from the very same mistake he almost made. Idun vs. Fiora from Xenoblade Chronicles 1 uh, spoilers for Xenoblade, by the way, but you could probably guess that. Young women who only ever wanted peaceful lives for themselves, but were kidnapped by those who wanted to spread war and exterminate their enemies. They had their minds subdued and were forced to fight for those enemies, but in time, both would be saved by the power of friendship, particularly due to young men with magical swords that could seal divine power. Normally, I do the challenger first, but let's just get this over with. Idun doesn't have a much beyond lore implications. As the demon dragon, she was presumed to be ungodly powerful. So powerful that the whole nuclear winter thing happened just from them trying to kill her and the people controlling her. Even then, she was spared out of pity, but that potential power is still within her. A lot of it is just potential, however, so there isn't much for me to talk about in this case. Other than that, she does have the power to create war dragons, which are mostly mindless animals which mimic the power of true dragons. Fiora, on the other hand, has a lot more. While it's debatable whether she'd get to control her face mech on as she would when under Maineth's control, even without it, Fior was capable of commanding Maineth's power in the form of Final Cross, which instantly topples her target. Outside of that, she has attacks which drain power and energy, induce sleep, increase speed and attack power in exchange for defense, regeneration, and so on. Her combat drone's abilities change based off the armor she has equipped, and can be used for crowd control, multi-hit combos, or defense and debuff immunity. We can also possibly consider Manus' own power, which was able to temporarily rival another god named Zanza, who was fixing to remake the universe. Though, needless to say, Fiora is winning this fight. It's a death battle, so obviously Eden has to die, plus without the Binding Blade she can't be saved like in the main story of her own game, but I think it'd suit this matchup to end on a more somber note. After fighting Eden up to the end, Fiora realizes that she really doesn't want this deep down, but is unable to do more for her putting her out of her misery in the only way possible. It's been a while since we got a good mercy-killing end to a death battle, and I think a Xenoblade character would probably be right up that kind of thematic alley. On to the quick Sacred Stones entries, Leon vs. Vati from Legend of Zelda. Admittedly, this matchup was one I expressly had to look around the community to see other people's matchups for, but that's just because I didn't know Sacred Stones too much, and I had limited ideas for characters like Leon. But Vati seems like a good match. Young mages who should be allies to the main heroes but are corrupted in their pursuit of power, either by the power itself or a darker entity attached to said power. Through an attempted sacrifice, they plan to become powerful enough to rule the world, but their own plans ultimately fall apart, and they're reduced to monsters of their own making. Vati and Leon would have a lot of similar spells, primarily elemental attacks and the like. Both Vati and Leon appear to have magical powers for absorbing energy, which would cancel each other out. However, they begin to differ with their utility. Vati has abilities like shapeshifting, levitation, affecting the weather, and on. Meanwhile, Leon can summon phantoms, create undead, teleport, cause paralysis, and use staves. 
Also, he evidently has some level of precognition, but I could not find a good example for its limits. While I'm not counting Leon as the same as Formortis, he was able to use some of that power via the Darkstone to accomplish many of these feats and appears to be able to amplify his regular magic, of both the offensive and healing varieties. If anything, it's like its counterpart, the titular Sacred Stone. If we're being perfectly honest, I'm not very familiar with either character, so I'm just going off what I could find about them through research. If I had to give one the edge, I'd say Vati. Now, I'm sure some would consider Formortis as part of Leon in other instances, and if you do, then I can see Leon being the winner, but as I'm just considering Leon, I'd say Vati would beat him. But it's not a bad matchup either way. Now for the actual big bad of Fire Emblem Sacred Stones, Formortis the Demon King versus Diablo from Diablo. Ancient Demon King specializing in corruption whose powers were so great they could only be defeated by being sealed away deep beneath the earth by the power of special stones. Over the eons, they would manipulate and scheme so others would fall into their traps and free them, allowing them to wreak havoc across the world once more. Diablo and Fomortis would both be great choices for an army fight, or at least have said armies as background action. The dungeon from the titular Diablo game and every monster found within Sacred Stones are servants to their respective masters, and it'd be interesting to see the two forces play off each other while the big guys do the real fighting. Diablo has your classic demon stuff, fire manipulation, and great strength, but he takes it all to an extreme level. As one of the prime evils, he has fought the highest end beings in his world, and though he may have wound up sealed away, it's more a testament to his power that things like armies of archangels which could destroy mountains couldn't kill him. He can teleport at will and create constructs of bone, fire, or lightning, create actual shadow clones, or drag his enemy into his realm of terror, where his power is amplified. He's got a large list of spells, too, including Apocalypse, which is a screen-wide attack, although it can be blocked by certain spells. His only clear weakness is Holy Damage, which I doubt Fomortis would be able to take advantage of. Not to mention Diablo has resistances to fire and lightning, so if Fomortis was combined with Leon, then many elemental spells wouldn't do much either. Formortis, meanwhile, has the blessed and rare ability to move, something so few Fire Emblem villains have. Less impressively, he has the spell Nightmare, which can put to sleep a ring of enemies around him, Ravager, which is basically just him punching really hard, but as an item, it gives Formortis an increase to strength, skill, defense, and magical resistance. And finally, Demonic Light, which is the equivalent of him opening his mouth and dropping a bomb, since it appears as a screen-covering light that deals high damage, and increases all the same stats as Ravager, plus an increase to his luck stat. His very blood is poisonous, and can cause ecosystems to become plagued wastes for generations. And while I'm not one for power scaling usually, it should be noted that the Darkstone was used to halt a country-spanning earthquake. And the Darkstone is powered by Fomortis' soul, in case anyone was worried Diablo would just get an easy win on him. Also, he appears to have some level of immunity to heat and fire if he can survive regular contact with lava pools, although he could still be hurt by fire magic if somewhat limitedly. It feels like we haven't gotten a proper personal doomsday villain death battle in a while, if that makes sense. Where both are these forces of nature that upend the world around them as they fight, but are on a much more personal, small-scale level. Not like Unicron and Galactus who are throwing around galaxies at each other, but are instead crushing and destroying countryside as people, regular people, are running away in terror. We could get real destructive with these two, showing the earth shattering from their attacks, Diablo warping the land beneath them and Fomortis' shed blood poisoning the environment. With how cunning both are, you could create a very interesting scenario of these two actual demon lords trying to outsmart each other, whether with their armies, words, or unique abilities like Leon's precognition, if, again, you consider him and Formortis as part of a whole. Setting up the fight between these two wouldn't be that hard because, well, they're demon lords who want to dominate the world and would refuse to be second to anyone. It could even be set up to be a sort of hope the lesser of two evils wins kind of thing where bystanders are forced to watch the apocalyptic clash and pray that whoever comes out the victor is better than the alternative. Wait, did I just describe a kaiju fight? As for who would win, left in the air. I'd like to say Fomortis just because some of his more unique traits, but realistically, if we're talking about power scaling, which of course Death Battle would, I'd put my money on Diablo. Traveling into the Radiant era of games, we have the Black Knight, aka Zelgis, versus Nosferatu Zod. 
Unlike with Burkut and Griffith, this is a pair I honestly could see being pretty good, and I'm glad to see that it's well liked in the circles that know about it. Blood Knights with elongated lives who seek thrilling combat and worthy challengers forever bound to mercenaries turned unlikely heroes that come to seek vengeance upon them for one reason or another. One blessed by a goddess and the other a demon, despite that, they both hold to a code of honor that means they have no interest in foes too weak for themselves. Zod isn't very complicated mechanically, but in his simplicity there is strength. With direct compatibility to Guts, which Death Battle has covered before, and enhanced senses and a powerful regeneration ability, Zod isn't easy to put down. With his Apostle form, he becomes even bigger and more powerful. He gains the ability to fly, and he grows to greater size. While in examples of strength, Zelgis may not be equal, he has survived some impressive feats, such as having a castle fall on top of him, a bonus of his blessed armor that I don't know if Zod could counter. In a similar vein, his sword, Alondite, is blessed by a goddess, and could be the kind of weakness Zod has never had to face. Of course, that is speculatory. Even if it doesn't, Alondite still gives a bonus to defense and is comparable to Ragnall. Again, we see the Nihil skill present and accounted for with its unclear function in a death battle, but more importantly we have the skill Imbue that heals him for an equivalent amount of health equal to his magic stat, meaning he can just heal himself freely as long as there's a window to do so. Finally, we have the Eclipse skill that increases his strength and ignores all the defenses of the target, meaning any durability Zod has could, depending on interpretation, just go out the window once this skill is activated. Take these into account and the question of the winner goes towards whether Zod's raw might could overcome Zelgius' unique abilities and frankly hard to overlook wall of his armor and sword. If I had to choose, I'd give it to the Black Knight. Okay, okay, hear me out. I've seen this once or twice, and I think it's really good. Ashnard versus Senator Armstrong from Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. Extremist political leaders wanting to use excessive violence to bring about great change in their worlds and countries due to the belief that said world and countries have become too steeped in corruption. In their social Darwinian mindset, it's better to uproot everything and let those left alive rebuild into a better world than to let the corruption seep any further, resulting in young, more idealistic heroes go after them, during which said heroes come to have more tempered but still heroic ideals, which fuel them to defeat the villains. While one is fantasy and the other is kind of sci-fi, they're actually pretty decent against each other. Armstrong's nanomachines and Ashnard's blessed armor are both typically impervious save for very specific weapons which neither really have. Ashnard has no special high-frequency blade and Armstrong's fists are most certainly not blessed by any higher power save for raw patriotism. Armstrong's nanomachines harden to match the impact of any incoming attacks and can even reattach any lost limbs as shown in his fight against Jetstream Sam. This regeneration can also be supercharged by absorbing nearby energy from technology. If we give Armstrong Metal Gear Exilus, that could serve as both a source of extra energy if it gets broken, and could show a nice contrast to Ashnard's smaller mount. His nanomachines also give him a kind of magnetic power that can be used to levitate nearby machines around, as projectiles to again spice up the fight dynamic, and could even be used as a reason to why Ashnard loses his mount. Though I personally think it'd just be cool for Armstrong to drop kick a dragon, but that's just me. Ashnard rides the black dragon Lagu Rajeon, who has a weakness to thunder magic and is able to breathe a physically based black breath, although Rajeon himself is driven completely mad and is only able to follow Ashnard's commands. Ashnard possesses the renewal skill that grants a low rate of regeneration that, while giving Ashnard some survivability, is definitely lesser than Armstrong's. However, his Daunt skill causes nearby enemies to have their attack rate lowered, resulting in lower accuracy. And Ashnard is capable of wielding most swords and axes, but he's usually only using the sword Gurgarant, which boasts a high hit rate and attack power, though the sword itself does not appear to be magical or blessed in any fashion. You could expand Ashnard's list of weapons based off other weapons in the game that he could possibly use, but just like with other villains up to this point, unless he were a recruited character, I don't tend to list those since it's like saying, of course Wolverine can use a gun. We just never see him do that. I only make this distinction because Ashnard can technically be used in the trial maps of this game, but nowhere outside that and it's clearly non-canonical. Funny thing, Ashnard and Armstrong would probably get along pretty well, but because of their ideals, they're compelled to fight to see who is stronger and who is worthy of leading the world forward. Armstrong could start out in Exilus before being torn out by Ashnard and his mount, which in turn ends up being kickballed by Armstrong Raiden style, bringing the fight down to the ground. 
From there, Armstrong and Ashnard would find their weapons doing very little to each other. But I think it'd end with Armstrong managing to get a necessary shot on Ashnard's head, or finding some natural chink in his armor, which could be exploited unlike the naturally adaptive nanomachines. Almost there. We have Sephirin, aka Laron, versus Jin from Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Old heroes who once fought side by side with humans to defeat a godlike destroyer, but through great tragedy finds the love of their lives lost, their very flesh and power marred by the world and becoming drenched in despair in no small part due to the actions of humans against them. And they find themselves only hoping for an end. And to do that, they seek to become the very thing they sought to protect against and bring about the end of the world. One hopes to do it by the power of a god, and the other wants to do it through spiting and killing a god. So once kind men become the instigators to incredible loss and tragedy in pursuit of the end of all life. Oh yeah, even here I managed to make it come back to Xenoblade. All is right with the world. Jin is an ice elemental blade, although one who has become a flesh eater by devouring the heart of his driver. Moving on from that, Jin's elemental control device expanded upon becoming a flesh eater. But he also lost the same natural regeneration a blade normally has in exchange for that independence from a driver. Just to talk about the most important part, Jin canonically has a max speed, the speed of light, and Sephirin canonically wields light magic. In fact, he has some of the strongest, so in that regard at least, there seems to be balance. Jin's light speed appears to be a result of a deeper power he has, the power to control and manipulate elementary particles, which generally make up all things. Meaning that a lot of elemental spells would be ignored by Jin, so it's a good thing Sephirin uses light and dark spells. Jin has been able to keep up with the Aegises, who are the strongest blades bar none, even before becoming a flesh eater, and afterwards his power only grew, albeit with the drawback of an unstable body which can weaken and break down without frequent care. He has resisted the effects of the blade Haze, whose abilities effectively function like the silence spell and could be used as an example that he too could resist the full effects of that staff. But that's more debatable. Sephirin, however, has a lot of possible workarounds for Jin's abilities, especially his staves, because, of course. As a canonically recruitable character, he actually can have access to way more than what I'd assign him as a standard villain, which includes the aforementioned Silent Staff, the Rewarp Staff to allow for instant teleportation, the Coronis Skill, which he already comes with to negate magical resistances and lower attack accuracy, and the Mantle Skill that is attached to a protective aura that he emits. Mantle is a beast of a skill that negates any damage that does not come from blessed weapons, allows for limited regeneration, and combines the Nihil and Fortune skills together. Although, I'll just say right now, I'm not 100% sure he would get the Mantle skill, but that's just situational. As we've covered before, the Nihil skill prevents the activation of enemy skills, while Fortune negates all critical hits. While the latter would probably have no function in a death battle, Nihil again introduces an odd question as to how it would work. That's because Jin does have some skills that could feasibly be considered in the same vein as Fire Emblem skills, and therefore could be negated. But, honestly, I don't know. The Rudal Gem, which Sephirin carries, boosts his physical defense, as does the Ashura Staff he comes equipped with upon recruitment. And the Sleep Staff is another unique obstacle Jin may be unable to counter directly save for through plain fortitude. I think setup would be pretty easy. Jin wants to end the world through killing a god, and Sephirin wants to end the world through a god's judgment. Or Sephirin wants to protect the world he once tried to end, depending on how late we're talking in his development. Of the matchup so far, this could be a remarkably emotional one, and a kind of antithesis to Duke vs. Zephiel. Whereas Duke would have just given up on Zephiel, Sephirin can see his past self in Jin, and through their fight could try to dissuade him from this path, with much needed violence, of course. But while Sephirin is pushed back and his weapons break, Jin pushes on and kills him. Only for Jin to realize in those last moments the truth of Sephirin's words, allowing for a possibly emotionally resonant and theoretically happy ending of a sorts. Happier than most death battles, anyway. And if Sephirin is determined the winner, it could be more bittersweet, with Jin realizing the error of his ways only in death and dying in peace in the arms of a man who finally understands him. Either way, one of these men would finally find the rest they so longed for. Finally, for a matchup that for some reason no one else has seemed to think of, Ashura and Jigalag, the Daedric Prince of Perfect Order. Dualistic deities of order who have a chaotic counterpart which exists as their eternal rival, and whose end they seek. They remain sealed away but are freed either by the occurrence of their cyclical nature, 
or by the machinations of their worshippers, and immediately begin trying to wipe away the world to replace it with their better version of it. Cold and emotionless in pursuit of true order, they're only defeated by champions of their chaotic halves channeling that power to put an end to their rampage. Despite their insistence upon their orderly nature, both show signs of chaos within, such as Ashura's emotional hatred of Yune and Jigalag's hyper-aggression towards his other half or their successor. Among one of the higher concept fights we'll cover here, Ashura vs. Jigalag has the potential to be an absolute banger. Jigalag's powers are Jigalag's powers are heavily lore-based, but Death Battle has shown they can work with another Elder Scrolls character, the Dragonborn. Jigalag was once and could still become the mightiest of the Daedric Princes, who are concepts made manifest in the primeval plane of Oblivion. The Daedric Prince of Order Jigalag reigned over a large swath of Oblivion until he had to be brought down by all other Daedric Princes united together, which can give us an idea for Jigalag's power scaling though an argument can be made the other princes weren't as strong as they are now because of Jigalag's power. As the Prince of Order, Jigalag had amassed a near-perfect understanding of the universe, and could predict down to an almost exact. However, it's obviously flawed, as Jigalag wound up transformed into Sheagorath anyway, and trapped in the process of becoming him again and again. Jigalag has the power to teleport, make portals, manipulate souls, matter, and magic, and affect reality itself by his presence. Despite that, he has still been beaten by the hero of Kavach, who had mantled the essence of Sheagorath, again suggesting he may not be as powerful or as all-knowing as is led on. Or perhaps it was simply due to both being within the Shivering Isles, which would have technically been both their home planes, and therefore their power was equalized. Some of his powers, such as manipulating souls, could be countered at by Ashura, who herself has shown to be able to create and destroy them, Ashura is also capable of casting a silence effect on the entire area, which only a few are able to resist, and can call down light from a seemingly endless range. An idea corroborated by the fact that she was able to petrify almost an entire continent on a whim, only saving a few called the Branded since they did not exist within the parameters she has set for herself. With her all-powerful mantle skill, she can negate the damage of any weapons not blessed by her other half, Yune, the Goddess of Chaos which could be a genuine problem for Jigalag, who is a being of order himself. It also allows a modicum of regeneration should damage be dealt, and combines the Nahil and Fortune skills as mentioned before. You might think these two would have no reason to fight each other, as 1. they're both gods of order, and 2. one inhabits the material world and the other inhabits the realms of oblivion. However, there are a few ways to depict this. 1. Ashura can sense the former bits of Sheagorath within Jigalag and perceive him as imperfect and therefore unfit to call himself an embodiment of order, or Jigalag's Grey Marsh could reach into Tellius and threaten Ashura's own idea of order. Both want things to become frozen, halted in place, but their reasons are wholly different. Ashura sees it as her creations betraying her and wanting to start again, while Jigalag simply does it because he wants this. He needs no further explanation. Either way, watching two beings of supposed order get angry at each other while they create more chaos and destruction in their wake would make for a unique fight dynamic. Definitely my favorite matchup of this series so far. As for who would win? Well, Jigalag is a god so great he was feared by other gods, and Ashura is but half of a god. Their scaling would likely just be that different. Although, I do have a lot of Fire Emblem characters losing in this video. Oh well. On that disappointing note, we'll have to wrap up the pre-awakening era of Fire Emblem games. Next time, we enter the days of the 3DS and the games that saved Fire Emblem, as well as Fates. But let's not worry about that right now. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and share the video around to help contribute to the growth of this channel and the increase of more videos just like this one. A shout out to all my patrons for your continued support and thank you the viewers for getting this far. If you want to support what I'm doing and help make it so I can turn this gig into a full-time job, I'd greatly appreciate you donating to my Patreon and joining the wall of lovely folks here on screen. It is entirely optional, as is my YouTube memberships, but if you do support me, you'll gain access to a private Discord server where you can relax with me and all these lovely people. With that said and done, I am the Hearth Guy, and I will see you all next time, Around the Hearth.